1 Corinthians chapter number 2, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. He says, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the, thing which, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of God save the spirit of man which is in him? Even, though, even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak. Not in the world, and on the worlds which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, uh, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? That, they, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. I want to preach on that last phrase there, the mind of Christ, the mind of Christ. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and your grace and your word. And I pray that you would bless uh, your word being preached right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated. Have you ever thought about why people are so different? Why... Different people react differently to the exact same stimulus. When something will happen and some people cheer, some people cry. Some people seem so kind, yet some others seem so harsh. I know during a single sermon we can have somebody cry and maybe come down to the altar and pray and just try to get things right. Somebody else will get mad and walk out. All in the same sermon. You're thinking, man, oh man, what in the world just happened? Some people come out and go, like, preacher, thank you so much. I really needed that message. And somebody else walked by and go, I don't appreciate you preaching against me. Are you serious? Verse 13 tells us we're dealing in spiritual matters. Verse 14 says that the natural man can't receive it. He's carnal, not spiritual. and Carnal people can't discern spiritual things. We're trying to deal in spiritual matters. You go into a neighborhood. All the houses look alike. Same kind of socioeconomic situation up and down the street. Same racial back up, makeup up and down the street. You knock on one door, introduce yourself, tell them you're there to talk about the Lord, end up, somebody end up getting saved. Weeping in tears, crying out unto God, trusting in the Lord for their salvation. Go next door, they might chase you away with a broom, sick their dog on you and chase you down the street. Different kinds of people react to things very differently. And not just out in the world. Sometimes it happens in a church setting. The key is having the mind of Christ. If you watch a particular news channel, your mind will be influenced by that. If you watch a Fox News you're going to have one way of thinking. If you watch CNN, you're going to have another way of thinking. If you watch BBC, you'll have another way of thinking. Uh, you know, if you watch Channel 5, it's a little bit different than Channel 11. And things are a little different. And, and, and if you watch those, the bias of the person that's speaking, over time will have an effect. The things that people say over and over, you'll become... Sympathetic to it. That's why today a lot of people, if you just stare at the television all the time and listen to worldly music, 
you're less apt to hear the things of God. To desire to hear the things of God. Or if for whatever reason you, you've decided somewhere along the way that you're smarter than everyone else. And everyone else is stupid. And you've got it all figured out. And you don't need to learn anything. And you don't need to hear anything. And you don't need to be reminded of anything. Suddenly you'll stop receiving truth. When we think that we've arrived, I mean, I put it like this a lot of times. It's really hard to teach somebody something when they already know it all. You know, if you're trying to show somebody how to do something, and you're like, okay, here's how we're going to do it. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, look, dude, I'm real done, real fast. I don't have patience for that stuff. Just hush, even though you already know everything, let, just humor me. Humor the old man and just let me go ahead and run through my spiel. And then once we're done, then, then you can go back to knowing it all. But for just a minute, be kind and humor me and pretend like I'm teaching you something. And uh, Because if not, then it gets messed up and then it's your fault because you didn't train them right. You know, we end up in, in a situation where when it comes to spiritual matters, people put a very low account they put a very low value on spiritual matters in their life. They're like, what? I'm saved. That's enough. But hey, I know how to draw a straight line or I'm an artist so I can do an artist or you know, I'm a, I'm a real estate mogul so I can do all this or hey man, I know how to invest in the stock market so I know how to take care of this. And, I, and, and until the housing market goes or the stock market goes or nobody's buying your art, and then suddenly you're looking around going, what happened? What happened? And you're trying to, you'll try to help somebody with their family. Or you'll be teaching on it, teaching on it. Like, I don't really like the way you, you teach on that. I don't think your, your role for the dad, I don't think you teach that right. And the role for the mom, I don't think you teach that right. And I don't, I don't, I don't agree with what you're doing. And then when they mess it up at home because they've already talked bad about what the preacher was preaching right out of the Bible, then all of a sudden they come like, here, preacher, fix it. I've pinned you in for 30 minutes. Fix my whole family. I've ruined it for years. But I want you to fix it. Hey, I'm telling you guys, it's hard to undo years of ignorance. It's hard to get through years and years of hard-headedness. And the scriptures are clear. Remember, this is the book of 1 Corinthians. This is where Paul is spanking a church that it had allowed wicked sin. It was full of worldly, carnal Christians. And Paul is trying to tell them there is a difference between spiritual and carnal. And you can't mix the two. They're just not going to go together. It's oil and water. And if you're going to be spiritual, be spiritual. If you're going to be carnal, at least don't pretend to be spiritual. He says we have the mind of Christ. I said before, if you watch a certain news channel, you watch a certain thought process, if you read from the same uh, editorials and you read the same uh, author over and over and over again, you'll end up seeing. And, and what happens is at first you'll read it and you're kind of like, whatever. And then you'll start anticipating what they're going to say based on their beliefs that you've learned. And eventually you'll end up believing those things yourself. It'll have an effect on you. It's no different than in the scriptures. You read this book enough, it'll have an effect on you. So the question is, do you want to be affected more by the Dallas Morning News or the New York Times or Fox News or CNN, the Communist News Network, or, some, or do you want to be affected by the Bible? Well, which one are you spending the most time with? Somebody says, well, I grew up in church, and I've been in church, and I know that. Hey, man, there's not one of us that doesn't have a whole lot to learn from this book. I don't care if you're 8 or 88, spent your whole life teaching from this Bible. Read it again, and you'll learn something. Amen. You'll learn something. But we just think that we've arrived sometimes, and we need to be careful about that. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him. I don't need to hear that message. I already heard that message. 
Well, you already paid your taxes last year, but you're going to pay them this year too. There's some things that God wants you to be reminded of. I promise because he laid on my heart to preach it. Three quick ways. Number one, personal study. You coming to church is good. Coming three, what, what old Lee Robertson used to teach? Three to thrive. It takes three to thrive. Three services a week. That's the only way you're going to thrive as a believer. Three to thrive. Even if you're coming to church three times a week, making Sunday school, teaching Sunday school, it still does not replace you reading your Bible at home. It does not replace that. We read as a family. That doesn't replace me reading by myself. We read four or five chapters a night, but I still got to study outside of that. And four or five chapters ain't enough for the preacher. And I've taught two different seminaries. I've still got a lot of studying to do. I've still got a lot of learning to do. And we need to stay at be, be, always be students of the word, never think that we've arrived and we know it all. We constantly need to be in search of truth and in personal spiritual growth. And that happens through personal study. If we're going to have the mind of Christ, we need to study Christ. And you'll find Him in the book. We need to study Christ. If I were going to, if, if, if there was going to be a play, and I was going to uh, portray George Washington in a play, and it was an important play, and it was something that really mattered, I would study every aspect of George Washington. I'd want to know how he walked. I'd want to know how he talked. I'd want to know who he spent time with. I want to know what he read. I, I want to know how he wore his hair, how he wore his clothes. I want to see every aspect of him. I want to know what he believed. I want to read every quote. I'd want to memorize and study quotes. I would want to know everything so that when it was my time to portray him, that I could portray him in a believable way. Not just in an entertaining way because I was in a play, but I would want to portray him in an accurate way that might help the, the viewers see George Washington. But friend, we've not been called to portray George Washington. We've been called to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the light of the world, he said. As long as he's in the world, he, he said, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. But he said, ye are the light of the world. See, he's gone to heaven, so we're Jesus. We're his hands, we're his feet, we're his wallet, we're his mouth. It's our job now to love on people and serve people the same way that Jesus Christ loved and served people and helped them. It's our job. If we're going to be Christ-like, and the only way that's going to happen is if we study him. Study his words. Know who he was talking to. Know the context. There's a reason that he would call a woman and her daughter dogs when she was just praying. There's a reason that he would walk on water. There's a reason that he would call out and say, I healed ten lepers, there's just one, where are the nine? When a bunch of disciples walks away, there's a reason that he looks and says, will ye go away also? There's a reason for that, and through diligent study we find the reasons. And we need to know who he's talking to, what the setting is. We need to learn his heart. We know, shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. We need to know why he wept. We're independent Baptists, we know why he wept. Because they weren't going soul winning, because they weren't tithing, because they weren't dressing right, they were listening to the wrong kind of music. No, that's not why he wept. We need to, go, we need to understand why. Jesus wept. We need to know the mind of Christ that we can have the mind of Christ. We need to learn to react to situations the way Jesus reacted to situations. We need to, we need to learn to have compassion like Jesus had compassion. And by the way, you could throw away this sissy idea of who the world would like for Jesus to be. Read the historical Jesus. He was all man and he was bold in his speech. We need to be bold like Jesus was bold. And that comes, friend, through personal study. If we're going to have the mind of Christ, we need to really know Him. Not just know about Him. We need to know Him. That would be the difference in reading a bunch about a George Washington 
and then going back in time and meeting George Washington. There's a difference in knowing about him and knowing him. You may know a politician. You may know who President Obama is, but you don't know him. You may have a pretty good idea based on some of his policies and some of the decisions, and you've listened to some speeches, but you haven't spent one-on-one -on -one time with him. You may not want to. But if you were ever going to know him, you would really know him if you spent time with him and spoke with him and talked with him and ate with him and fellowshiped with him. Listen, we need to fellowship with Jesus Christ. We need to stay close to him. We need to genuinely know him that we might have the mind of Christ. Otherwise, we'll end up spending our time with the world and the entertainment world, and we'll end up being carnal and not able to receive spiritual things. Secondly, we ought to fellowship with other believers. The Bible says iron sharpeneth iron. And uh, we, we would do well to look at <clears throat> and spend time with people who are more spiritual than we are. Now, I know for many of us that's very difficult because we're so spiritual and it's just difficult to find those folks. Just try real hard. <laughs> and if we can, uh, you know, maybe you have to find somebody just to level down because of our, you know, our great spirituality and humility. But if we, if we really want to be a better Christian, you need to hang out with better Christians. There was a high school kid one time, and he was going out to a park, and there were a couple of pickup games of basketball going on. And there was some little kids over here, you know, a little bit smaller than him, and they were just kind of fumbling around. And then there were some guys over here that were like really good. And the teenager went over that way. Started playing with those guys. He was dunking on them. He was showing them up. Man, they looked foolish. He looked like a pro. I called him over. I said, hey, bud. Why are, you, uh, why are you over there? You should be over here. He's like, oh, I can't keep up with those guys. I said, you're not going to get any better playing with these kids. Why don't you go over here and get roughed up a little bit? Why don't you get over here where it's a challenge? Why don't you get over here where you don't quite measure up so you'll be challenged? I mean, that'd be the difference in playing one-on-one -on -one against me or Shaquille O'Neal. Well, I'm not going to chase you up and down the court. I'm just going to trip you and knock you down when you come by. You're not going to get any better playing basketball against me. You play against Shaquille O'Neal, he's going to hurt you for a while. But you know what? Eventually, you would learn how to get a shot off. And if you can get a shot off with him, you're much better now. That's where you learn. You learn with the best. What I'm saying is we ought not hang out with, boy, this is going to sound tacky. You ought not hang out in a crowd of people not as spiritual as you are. It's a lot easier for you to get drugged down than for you to pull people up. You ought to hang out with people that are more spiritual than you are. If I'm hanging out with a group of preachers, I want to be the worst one of the bunch. I want to hang out with these super spiritual guys. I, I want to hang out with the guys. I don't want to hang out with the guys over here where I can go, you know, okay, man, I can hang with these guys. They're, they're, you know, they're about my level, whatever. I want to hang out with the guys who look like they just, like, just went on a walk with Jesus. I want to hang out with the guys who are so spiritual. It looks like, I mean, like they might actually be praying with their eyes open right now. They're, that, they're so spiritual. I want to be around those guys because I want to be challenged to pray more. I want to be challenged to study more. I want to be challenged in every way to be a better Christian in my walk with Christ. So fellowshipping with Christians is a big part of having the mind of Christ. You want to know what the mind of Christ is? Spend some time with some people who are around him a bunch. And thirdly, service. Service. We live in a world where people are perfectly satisfied to show up, warm a pew for a few minutes, and then head to the house. And there's really nothing. If you said, what'd you do for God this week? It's like, you graced him with your appearance. I went to church. Well, listen, I'm glad you, you came to worship. I hope that's why you came. That's what we were going to do. But the truth is, there ought to be something that we get done at, by the time we get done with the week or every day that we can look at and go, you know what? 
I did that for God. There's no other reason. There was no personal benefit. There was no financial benefit. There was no, nobody, no attaboys. There was no camera running. Nobody's going to pat me on the back. Nobody's going to tweet about it. There's not a single twit that's going to tweet about it. Nobody's going to post it on their Facebook. Nobody's going to brag on me. In fact, nobody even knows. But I did that for God. I did that because I'm, I'm an ambassador for Christ. That's the kind of stuff that we should have. Do you know Jesus lived it? He lived service. He walked places he didn't have to walk so he could heal people that he didn't have to heal. He fed people he didn't have to feed. And certainly at the end, he died for people he did not have to die for. Right at the very end, one of his last acts with his disciples was that he removed his regular clothing and gird himself up with a towel and he went and washed the disciples' dirty feet. You think your feet are nasty? I think your feet are nasty. You think your feet are nasty though? Imagine a bunch of people over in the Holy Land walking around in sandals and just callous, dirty, hard, caked on. Just as soon as you touched water to it, it was going to turn to mud and you'd have to wipe all that junk off. Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, God Himself in the flesh knelt down before His disciples, the Master before the servants, and He served them. And He washed their dirty feet. Jesus lived it. He taught it. He lived it. He commanded it. He told us that we were going to have to go out and serve. He told us. He taught it. He showed. I like what He told Peter. Peter who had been there for the miracles. Peter who had seen Him on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter who had walked on water. Peter who denied Him when His life was on the line. Jesus told him, Lovest thou me? Oh Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. Hey Peter, lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. Hey Peter, don't ask it Lord, don't ask it again. Lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. He said, Peter, we've been through a lot together, man. Only guy in history ever walked on water. Still today. One of the inside three, Peter, James, and John, so close. They, they went a little further to pray. They went into Jairus' house to see the daughter raised from the dead. They went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. The inside three. And he said, lovest thou me? Do you love me? Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Serve! If you love me, serve! You read through the Gospels. Jesus is talking to the Jews. Talking to the Jews about this. Talking to the Jews about that. Trying to get them set straight. After the cross. You come to Matthew 28. And He says, All power is given unto Me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. And serve. Teach them. Win them to the Lord. Baptize them and teach them. Serve. Do something. And we serve in a physical way, not in a, in an advisory capacity. Oh, look, there's some trash that needs to be picked up. Well, honey, pick it up. Oh, look, this needs to get done. Do it. Praise the Lord. 
There's a couple of things that we've created over the years. You remember in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was this quiet time. All of a sudden, they, they expanded the, the priest position, and then they had the, added scribes and Pharisees and lawyers. They added all these things that you didn't see in the Old Testament. There was no Pharisees, Sadducees. You didn't see those things in the Old Testament. Those, they, they were invented in that intertestament period, 400 years. They didn't have God, so we don't need God. We'll just create positions. So we can expand religion. You don't need God for religion. We create positions. In the early church, the, the apostles ended up getting deacons, and the deacons would do service, service, service. So you'd have men in the church that were involved serving all the time. Because the way the world and the way the church has morphed today, that's why you have, you know what you don't see in the New Testament? Church secretaries. Custodians. You don't see um, trustees. A trustee is just a deacon that doesn't qualify biblically. You don't, you don't see that stuff. But we've created those things and we've had to create paid positions. You got to pay somebody to play the piano. You got to pay somebody to mow the grass. You got to pay somebody to do this because grown men no longer serve in churches. You go into the Southern Baptist group and hey man, it's almost all women running the churches. And in fact, there's places now where they can't even find men to preach. They'll just get women preachers now. Because men won't step up and do, do the work. And no, we don't pay the piano players and stuff here. But I've been in churches where, where they did. They pay people to take care of the books. They pay people to play the pianos. Uh, they, they pay people to do everything. And I'm not trying to change the way that we have to do some things. What I'm saying is, is that if every believer had a heart and a mind of Christ and had a heart's desire to genuinely serve, there'd be no need. There'd be no lack. There'd be nothing. Can you imagine how fast the yard work would go if 20 people came up and hit the yard? That might even be too many. Can you imagine how fast painting would go if, ever, if 20 people showed up to paint? Can you imagine how fast a remodel project would go if 20 people showed up to demo and haul wood and run errands and fix lunch and bring cold drinks and uh, jump in there and help? I mean, everything would go so much faster. Can you imagine how many people, let's get, all right, we've talked about the physical, let's get spiritual. Can you imagine how many people might get saved if 40 people, 50 people showed up every week for soul winning? Can you imagine how our Sunday school classes might grow if 20, 30, 40 people went out and visited for Sunday school? Imagine all we're going to do until we start doing it. Our problem is, is that we kind of have a heart for it, kind of, but we don't ever get the mind of Christ. And you say, well, so you want me to study about it, you want me to fellowship, and then you want me to do it. Listen, friend, if you'll just do the study and, and, and then show up and do work, there's, the fellowship part happens automatically. There's a kindred spirit amongst people who do things together. There's a kindred spirit. Hey, the men that have worked on big projects here have a kindred spirit. They become friends based on the fact they showed up and worked and sweat together. And they didn't do it because it was going to raise their property value. They didn't do it because it was going to make their house easier to sell. They did it so the, so the roof wouldn't leak at church. They did it so that, uh, so that the, the, the wind wouldn't blow inside when it was blowing outside. They did it so it wouldn't look like trash. They did it so it looked nice. They did it for the glory and honor of God so that it might be a good testimony and make, make the church building not look like the worst building in the neighborhood. Amen! Our problem today is not that we don't have enough money. 
Our problem today is not that we don't have enough people. Our problem is that the people we have aren't, don't have the mind of Christ and don't serve. You have people with beautiful voices that don't want to sing in the choir. They don't want to sing out there. You got people who can play instruments that don't want to play an inst- wouldn't play Amazing Grace for the Lord if they were on fire. And that was the only way to put them out. We have people with great talent who refuse to use it for the Lord and it only goes to the world. And the problem is, it's not just men and women, but men and women who are carnally spirited then lead their children along that same path and we raise carnal children who don't love the Lord and then we wonder later on, well, what happened? Tell you what happened. We didn't have the mind of Christ. Our children didn't see us studying the Word of God. They didn't see us fellowshipping with believers. They didn't see us serving God and having a joyful spirit about not. Oh man, the preacher's going to beat me up. You're a liar. I've never beat anybody up because they didn't come to soul winning. Now you might have felt guilty, but I didn't do that. But instead of having a bad attitude, I'd be, hey man, let's go knock some doors, man. See what we can get into. Let's go knock on the door, see who's out there. Let's pray before we go and let's see if just maybe, maybe, just maybe, God will save somebody today. Hey, let's, let's go do this for the Lord. Hey, you know what? I know this family, it's kind of down and out. After we go knock a few doors, let's run down and buy some groceries, run it by this family's house, maybe be a blessing to them. Yeah, I expect it to be quiet. It's hard to amen about the mind of Christ when we don't have it. Study. Fellowship. Serve. It's what Jesus did. It's what his disciples did. How do you want to be known? It's your testimony. 